I'm going to be bringing out Ryan Stowers, turning things over to him. Ryan is the executive director of the Charles Koch Foundation, where he's been for over 15 years, uh, supporting research and funding innovations in post-secondary education. Um, and their approach to philanthropy is guided by equal rights, mutual benefit, openness, and self-actualization. Uh, he previously worked for the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and Ryan's going to be joined on stage by Freeman Rabowski. Uh, Freeman was the president emeritus, is the president emeritus of University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he served from 1992 to 2022. Uh, his research focused on science and math education with an emphasis on minority participation and performance. And in 2012, President Obama named him chair of the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Um, and he now serves as a consultant to the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Academies and Universities and School Systems nationally. We're really thrilled to have him here and we're really excited for their conversation. So here for a fireside chat uh, on American higher education, please give it up for Ryan and Freeman. <laughs> all right, wonderful to be here. It's great to see all these faces out here in Freeman. It's an absolute honor to, to be with you today. We met for the first time a week and a half ago. Yep. We had lunch together in, in Baltimore, yes. and it was incredible. I went to that lunch. Right. I was excited because of what I had read about you, what I had learned about you. I walked away with something even more special. I walked away having been inspired by someone who is genuinely good and who is passionate about making the world a better place. I left with a, a, a new friend, and, and I, I left wanting to be a, a better person. So thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you, Freeman. Man. Thank you. Today, um, I know we're, we're supposed to touch on, we're supposed to talk about Freeman's reflections on higher education from the past 60 years. But first, I want this audience to get a better sense as to who you are and what your story is. So my first question is, who is Freeman Arba Harbowski? Wow. wow. Okay. Hello. Great. Since they have the lights down, you're going to have to talk back to me so I can see you. I'm a math teacher. I look for eyes. Raise your hands in the back if you can hear me. Good. I mean, more lights. I like to see the faces of people. It's important. So I'm an educator. That's who I am. I'm a son of the South. I grew up in Birmingham in the 60s. I was a child leader in the civil rights movement. I sat in the back of church. I heard this guy say, if the kids would go, to, to go and march with us, we could show America that we can be a better place. And the kids can go to better schools. And by they, that, they meant go to white schools. And all I could think about was the fact that we were required to use these hand-me-down books from the white schools with brown paper bags around them. Couldn't even take new books into the school at one point. And I did go. Um, it was an empowering experience. We were treated like animals, like slaves. And yet, somehow, my parents uh, had said, listen to this man. The man, of course, was Dr. King. And he said this. He said, don't let anybody else define who you are. And I'll never forget sitting in that jail being treated like an animal, but remembering that I was far more than that and wondering what my future would be. And that was my beginning of thinking about what can I do with my life. And the message to me was that we must empower young people to believe in themselves. Regardless of circumstances, we must empower them to believe they can make the place better than it is. And that, that turned out to be a pivotal moment, not just for me, but for this society. Let me give you one example. Right after that, turns out, went through a horrific period of the assassination of President Kennedy, the killing of my little friends and four little girls, that documentary with Spike Lee. And before you know it, we had legislation, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Higher Education Act. Now, first of all, how many of you were not even in the world in 1965? Raise your hands. That is perfectly disgusting. I want you to know that. <laughs> And the reason I say that is that we must tell our stories. One of my students said to me once, Doc, you are walking history, which didn't sound right, but it is true that people who grew up in the 40s or 50s or 60s know a, an experience in this country that the majority, more than two-thirds, 70% of Americans don't know. Now, why do I tell you this? 
What percent of Americans do you think had graduated from, from college, from four-year colleges in the mid-60s? Take a guess, anybody? 20%. I heard 20%. It was only 10%. Only 10%. What percent of whites had graduated from college? 25? Anybody else? Now, I know this group is not risk adverse. Come on. 40. Believe it or not, it was only 11%. For blacks, it was 3 and 4%. And those were the only two groups, even in the 60s, people counted. Everything was black and white. Anybody remember black and white television? <laughs> kind of, kind of right. But the fact is that now, now what percent of, of college, what, what percent of Americans have a college degree? 30? Somebody else? 35? Anybody else? 50? How many of you don't know? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Good, good, good. So yeah, you're right. It's about 35%. It's about 40% of whites. It's about 30% of blacks. It's about only about 20% of Latinos. Um, for Native Americans, it's below that. For Asians, it's early 50%. But some Asian groups are far below that. It's not the whole group. Now, why do I tell you all that? Who am I? I'm somebody who's watched higher education and society grow so much so that many more people want to be getting a college education. I am a mathematician who gets goosebumps doing math. How many people in here get goosebumps doing math? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Notice how small the numbers. My life is devoted to getting more children, yes, to love to read, because if you give me a child who can read, I can teach her to do word problems, right? Okay, give me a round of applause for that idea, okay? All right? But to get more kids like him at, that's who I am. Education, mathematics, believing in children. If there's one thing I want on my tombstone, it is if you teach a child to believe in herself, all things are possible. Give me a round of applause for that idea. I had a, I had a different experience with math, but we won't go into that. Uh, so, Freeman, your, your whole life example is one of, of self-discovery and, and empowerment, individual empowerment. How can universities, given, given where we are now, yes. how can universities play a role in, in driving that in our, in our culture, in our country? What's the role of the university? The two things I would say, I, I was privileged to be president of UMBC for University of Maryland, Baltimore County for 30 years. Very proud of that. We are, the lead, we are a campus that has students from around the world with 60% having a parent from another country either from military, intelligence, diplomacy, or whatever. But here's the deal. We lead the country in producing blacks who go on to get PhDs in the natural sciences and engineering. Big round of applause for that. But students of all races. Now, the two things that I would say in higher education, as we reflect over this 60-year period, more people than ever want to go to college, whether it's two-year or four-year. But here's the deal. Number one, the majority of students who go to our colleges and universities do not graduate. We say the graduation rate is 60%, but that's very, 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 very unclear in that literally more than half the students of all races who go are below 40% in graduation rate after six years. So that's the first issue we have. Suppose we said that only a half the people who go into hospitals are successful. <laughs> it would be unacceptable. You get my point? So we've got to deal with that fact that so many people leave and that there are millions of Americans who started in college and now have big debt and they have not a degree, any kind of certification or anything else. So they're in worse shape than they were before. The other issue is we don't have enough people in STEM. Now, I'm the first to say we need to think about what Jim Collins said, the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. What do I mean? We need people who appreciate both STEM and the humanities and the arts. Give me a round of applause for that idea. We need both. We need both. They should not be. How many of you in this room had been taught before you went to college, you were either a math science type or you were a history English type? Raise your hands. You see, we tell people that if I'm a math teacher, usually what I end up saying to somebody is, uh, yes, yeah, stay with me or I'll help you get through this course, but don't come back. People get that message in so many ways. So the first thing we've got to do is to keep people from thinking that way. It doesn't mean you've got to become a scientist, but we wipe people out. And that's what the studies that we've done have shown, that we, weed out, we call the first two years of science and engineering weed out courses in America. And that's not just for average institutions. The more prestigious the university, the greater the chance of the student who starts with super high SATs, ACTs, will leave it. 
How many people in this room started off with a major in science and engineering and left and changed their majors? Tell the truth. Come on. Come on. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. I see some people doing like that, right? It happens all the time. So the key is, number one, help more students graduate. Number two, help more students who can make it in the STEM areas. But number three, to help more students become broadly educated who are grounded in the humanities, the ethics, understanding the challenges of the human experience, but also who value what technology will do for us. Those are the challenges that we face. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, you, we've seen a big shift and, and the investors and solution providers in this room have been a big part of this. There's, there's, a, there's a shift right now between degrees and skills. Yeah. Why is that shift important? to right. you from your perspective? So, so I would say again, the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. I still value a liberal arts education. I think there's something about getting a major in English. There's something about learning to read novels. I love Jane Austen and Dostoevsky. There's something about human behavior. We should never forget that the humanities are important. The arts are important. At the same time, it's very important for people to have skills they can use to get a job. Now, sometimes that means you learn a lot from the humanities, but there's nothing wrong with having, and we do some of this at UMBC, we work on these different skills in our UMBC training companies so that people can get skills that companies are looking for. So whether it's in cyber, we have a lot of cyber companies on our campus, for example, whether it's in AI, whether in information systems broadly, it's possible to do both. And that's where we've got to change our mindset from thinking one person is in one area or the other. We've got a lot of students in digital arts in digital humanities, in taking a, a, some, a set of courses in one area and being broad in their thinking. Because that broad thinking allows them to keep learning. And that's what you want. People want, as I'm working with companies, when I'm on boards, I'm looking to see people who can understand the importance of learning to keep learning all the time. And also to keep asking good questions. It was I.I. Robbie the Nobel laureate who said, when he was growing up, all of his friends' mothers would say, what'd you learn in school today? He said, but not my Jewish mother. My mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him to think, we want to give people the education that pushes them to be curious, to ask good questions. That's the point. You, you touched on something that I think is so important. The, the current higher ed system almost prides itself as they weed out yeah. the people who don't fit. Yeah. You've spent the last 30 years at, at UMBC changing culture yeah. from one of that, that exclusivity to inclusivity. Yes. yes. How, how, do you, how do you drive that? And how can, we, how can we make that, you know, there are a few schools that are highlights, but how can we make that culture change more broadly applied in, in higher ed? Sure, sure. You start with the notion that if we accept students into an institution, we have a moral responsibility to make sure they make it. How many of you remember? It's very important, very important. You know, when I was in college, um, uh, the dean said, look at the student, I want you to do this. Look at the student, to, look at the person to your left. Now look at the person to your right. And throughout the history of American higher education, presidents and deans have said, one of you will not graduate. That's a terrible thing to say to young people, because if I'm at all immature and the boys are always less mature than the girls, I'm saying, oh my God, I'm not going to make it, so I may as well party right now because I'm going to be gone next year anyway. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So what we say is look at the student to your left, go again, look at the person to your left, look at the person to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate, and if you don't, we are responsible also. Big round of applause for that idea. Big round of applause. It makes all the difference in the world. It's that believing in those students and helping them believe in themselves and helping them understand that they're not doing it just for money. No, it's good to have a little money, but also to make a difference. I mean, to be passionate about making a difference. So getting those students, my students, working with kids in D.C., or working with kids in inner city Baltimore, to see how much children need help in learning to read and think and to learn how to solve math problems and to see that it, there's power in that. What I learned from the civil rights movement as I was working on my little algebra problems, algebra problems and, and listening to Dr. King was that, that, that math and thinking in general and reading and explaining and understanding, all of those are skills that help us to solve problems. And that is the, that is the significance of education as we think about what we need to do in our universities and in our K-12. I love this emphasis of a belief in people. Yes. It's, it's powerful. And when you think about it as applied to, to what we're all doing here, yeah. 
So let's turn, let's turn the, the focus a little bit because much of what you did at UMBC right. was innovation. Yeah. It was experimentation. Sure. It was challenging the status quo. Sure. What, what advice can you give to leaders who are, who are running their own companies, running their own right. uh, around innovation yeah. and the power of, of, of it in solving the problems we're trying to sure. solve? Sure. So, so I start with my TED talk, which either gets people to hate me or love me, one or the other. And it's on success in science. A lot of my colleagues in STEM think I was too hard on us as a profession, but I am saying we can do much more. First, first of the four, four principles, first was high expectations. We always say high expectations, but we're talking about our students. But what about high expectations of ourselves? High expectations of ourselves, whether we are a company or a university, what else do we need to do? Whether it's for our customers, the people we're serving, how can we be better? I'm always saying to my colleagues, uh, how can we be more effective in teaching. If I go to the board and I put a problem up in differential equations and everybody says, wow, he's really smart. And then I give you a test on the problem and nobody passes the test. Did I teach it? No, I just presented it, right? But we have this mindset that once you put it on the board, now it's your responsibility. So high expectations of all of us, the teachers and ourselves. Number two, building community. We still have a cutthroat attitude in high school, in, in school, K through 12, and in universities. People are not taught to work together and they're, they're thought of as cheating. And yet when you look at your companies, people solve problems in groups. We know that. In labs, we solve problems in groups. I mean, the greatest achievement of some of my students right now, two of them, one was when the young woman at NIH led the team that produced the Moderna vaccine. That's the first black woman in the world to create a vaccine. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. Dr. Kismika Corbett, who's now in the faculty hall, she's one of my Mile High scholars, a little 17-year-old kid from North Carolina, but she worked with a group, led a team with Bunny Graham, and they did that. The other involves Kafri Zarasa at Duke, who has invented a pacemaker for the brain involving schizophrenia and bipolar disease, right? But he's got a team of people. So anytime you see these major discoveries, it's working in groups. So community is big. And then finally, being honest about evaluation, what's working and what's not. I think we sometimes check a box and say we evaluate it, rather than getting deeply into why didn't it work. It's asking the hard questions. Innovation, to me, is about, and we said it in my last book, The Empowered University, it's, it's shared leadership, culture change, and academic success. And, and I define culture by, the, the words of Eric Weiner in his book, um, The Geography of Bliss. He says, culture is the sea we swim in, so all consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out of it and look back at ourselves. And that's the challenge for all of us as we think about innovating. Because what Dr. King was saying, when he said that we can make this country better, it was the idea that we could, tomorrow can be better than today, but only if we make it so. It's that empowerment of employees, of students, and of faculty to say, we can be better than this, to not assume that it has to be the same way. Before I heard him saying that, I always thought I would be using used books in a world with only people looking like me. It was the first time my eyes opened to say, maybe I can see a world looking like you, and maybe I have something to offer to people different from me. That is innovation. That's the idea. That's powerful. Thank you. Freeman, this may be the hardest question I yeah, throw at you. Sure. So being introspective, if you could go back 30 years, 1992, and start at UMBC, what would you do differently? Ah, ah, I'd learn to laugh more first. <laughs> we, as the, the younger we are, the more seriously we take ourselves, right? One of my great mentors who lived to be 99 said, Freeman, live life seriously, but don't take it seriously. And his point was, don't take yourself so seriously. We tend to think that what we do tomorrow is going to make all the difference in the world. And I, I, I honestly believe every, my students often ask me this, and when I'm working with new college presidents, they often are saying, would you change some of those mistakes you made? No, I would not. I think there's something that's magical. This is going to sound really counterintuitive. There's something that's magical about failing. You can, you can quote me on that. Something that's magical. It opens eyes. It makes you more humble. It teaches you there's a better way. It makes sure you don't just keep going thinking you're wonderful. And when I was first president, I thought I was really cool. 
life taught me is I got knocked down and had to get back up. Not only the importance of resilience, but humility. Humility, right? Taught me to think about how I treat people. Taught me to listen to my students. Taught me to think about what I learned as a child. That I, The same way that Dr. King was wanting uh, to listen to the voices of the children, that I needed to learn to listen to the voices of my students and young, young colleagues because they have so much to give. And, so, and that, that is my, my gift to you, to think about your relationships, your humility, and that failure is not the worst thing. The worst thing is not to try, not to push it as far as you can. That is the gift to you. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. This is, this is incredible. Okay, last question, and we've got just a few seconds. But if, you, if you, you've got a, a room full of change agents. These are people that are trying to make education better to empower all learners to reach their potential. What advice do you give them for the next 5, 10, 50, 60 years? Keep looking at people who are making a difference. Keep asking them their stories. Quite frankly, we are inspired by stories. And the question I always ask every leader, every professional, every student, what is your story? How did you get to where you are today? You know, I am so honored that HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, has some incredible leaders. I've been pushing for years to say we need more people of color in the highest levels of science and engineering, and, and they have taken that seriously. And they've recently just named this special initiative to produce the very best scientists focused on diversity in the world, and they will be of all races, but including blacks and Latinos and Asians and Native Americans and women, but, but they've named the program after, it's a $1.5 billion initiative. Give HHMI a round of applause for that, for a $1.5 billion initiative. Now, the odd part for me is they've named the program after me, which is really strange, because you normally name something after somebody when they're dead, all right? So that's an odd feeling, but here's the point that they would tell you that's a first step. I mean, that's what we have to understand. If we're gonna make a difference in the culture of our country, if we're gonna talk about having more women in cyber and more people who are creating vaccines, so that Dr. Corbett is not the only black woman who creates a vaccine, for example, we're gonna need to not only invest the money, but our efforts in problem solving. That's what I would say to all of you with companies that we wanna use our best thinking, not just to check boxes, and not just to split us up. We need ways of combining people, of connecting people. This is a time when I think science and tech, but also the humanities can pull us together as a society to say, we believe in all of our children, but we must give them the skills and the values to succeed. That must be our message. Thank you very much. Thank you for inspiring us, Freeman. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you so much to Ryan and Freeman. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. I do this with my students all the time. Repeat after me, thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. One more time, thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. Here's your test, what your thoughts say become your? Ah, you were, you, were, you were saying it, but you weren't mindful. Now this time for the test. Be mindful. Thoughts. And say it like you mean it. You sound wimpy to me. Give it passion. We must have passion in education. Thoughts. Words. Actions. Habits. Character. Destiny. Watch your thoughts, they become your. Watch your words, they become your. Watch your actions, they become your. Watch your habits, they become your. Watch your character, it becomes your. A plus. Thank you. <laughs>